Hey guys, Sean here at the Gardener Center. So I wanted to spend a little time this week talking about a super popular group of perennials. Um, they may be familiar to a lot of you already. Um, this is a group of perennials known as catmints. Um, we also call them nepeta, that's their botanical name. But they are collectively known as catmints, not to be confused with catnip. They are very closely related to catnip. Cats do enjoy these as well. They don't enjoy them as much as catnip, but if you have cats at home, they'll enjoy your catnip, trust me, I know. Um, so this is a super popular group of perennials and they have a lot of reasons to be popular. Um, they check a lot of boxes as far as ornamental perennial plants go. So number one, they are super hardy plants. I talk to people every single day about their plants and their plant problems, and I rarely, if ever, hear anyone say, my nepeta died or my catmint died or I'm having problems with them. You know, that just rarely, if ever, happens. Um, so they're super hardy. They bloom for a really long time. A lot of perennials don't bloom for very long. So these guys bloom for a really long time. Usually here in Connecticut, they start to color up right at the very beginning of May. And then that color show goes right until the beginning of July is when they usually start to start to fade out for the first time. So they have a really long bloom time as well. They uh, have a very appealing color. I mean, who doesn't like purple? That mixes well with any with any perennial theme that, you're, that you have going. Uh, light purple is always is always a winner as far as colors go. You know, they're also um, they're very attractive to pollinators. If you're trying to you, if you're trying to garden with native plants for pollinators, they don't check that box. These guys are all from uh, Western Asia, so they're not native pollinators. But bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds adore these, and these are well-behaved plants from another place. They're not invasive. They're not nasty. They're not a problem in the garden. So there's absolutely no reason you can't plant these because bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds absolutely love them. So they're definitely a pollinator friendly plant. And they also are very drought tolerant. So they are tolerant of a hot, dry location, which makes them really appealing. And, you know, so they can um, go in a place where maybe you don't irrigate or maybe out by the mailbox by the street somewhere where you don't want to drag a hose, you know, you know, that sort of, of a situation. And the other thing that makes them really valuable in the garden is they are absolutely 100% resistant to animal browsing. Deer will not eat them. Rabbits will not eat them. Woodchucks will not eat them. They are just absolutely resistant to animal browsing, so you don't have to worry about spraying them or anything like that. So if you have a part of the yard where you need something where you have, or where there's a deer problem and you need a colorful plant, this is a great guy to use. So lots of lots of um, good attributes and lots of ways to use them. Um, years ago, the only nepetas and catmints were kind of the taller ones. In recent years, there's been a lot of plant breeding going on to make them shorter and more compact. A mistake that people make often with these guys is they is they'll you know you'll buy one of these and say oh well, that's going to look great and then we plant them too close together. Well, you know, these guys can grow three feet wide. Um, and these guys over here can grow three feet wide. So people make a mistake, they plant them too close together. Um, so you wanna be careful with your spacing on the bigger guys. This happens to be Walker's Low over here. And I've always had an issue with Walker's Low and I think it causes a lot of problems in people's landscape because of its name. So Walker's Low is a place in England that's what the plant was named after. It is not a description of its growth habit. It's actually one of the bigger catmints. So when you see Walker's Low, it's not talking about its shortness. It's talking about the garden in England that it was named after. So if you are looking for short ones, plant breeders have been doing a lot of work there. I have a couple of my favorites here on the table today. So this one over here is called Little Titch and little titch will only grow 12 inches tall and two feet wide. And this one over here is called Felix, which will also grow 12 inches tall and 24 inches wide. These guys are great if you have smaller spaces. They're great for edging um, along a driveway or around a mailbox like we talked about. Um, these are a great option for um, as an alternative to lavenders. 
If you have tried growing lavender and failed, and who hasn't, um, these dwarf nepetas are a great alternative because you're gonna have the opposite results with them. They are, you're not gonna plant 12 of these and then have only three still alive the following winter as often happens with lavender. Um, so the dwarf nepetas are a great lavender alternative. The taller ones do really well in a mixed perennial garden. Um, this, like I said, this is Walker's Low. This one over here is Junior Walker. So Walker's Low, 24, 24 to 30 inches tall. Junior Walker, about 15 to 18 inches tall. So that's the Junior Walker's a good one if you want that kind of medium sized one. These guys like a sunny, dry place. They will not work in a shady spot. And the other thing that's instant death for them is a excessively wet soil. A lot of mints love wet soil. This mint does not. Um, these guys are drought tolerant and prefer a drier soil. But like any plant that's drought tolerant, they always look better with regular irrigation. So you can water them as you would your other perennials. Um, a, a good thing to keep in mind right now, and it's the reason I wanted to do this video today, is these guys are soon to be finishing up their first bloom. And a mistake a lot of people make with their nepotas, and trust me, I see it almost every day during the summer, is after they're done blooming, they, people just kind of let them go. And that's a mistake for a couple of reasons. So if you garden yourself, if you have landscapers take care of your property, what you really want to do when your nepotus finish up their first bloom, which is going to be the end of June, beginning of July here in Connecticut, you want to cut them back. And that's critical for a couple of reasons. Number one, <clears throat> they have a tendency to look like a mess for the rest of the summer if you don't, because they'll, they'll bloom out and then they kind of continue to grow a little bit and they just kind of get very lax and they flop all over the ground and they, they look like a mess for the rest of the summer. So a good thing to do once most of your flowers are gone, like 80 to 90% past bloom, is to cut them back. And this is not something you have to take a week off from work to do. You don't have to you know, go out and start clipping the, the, little, the little spent flower spikes off. This is something you could do very easily and uh, quickly with your, with your clippers. So once the plant has 80%, 90% bloomed out, you want to take the whole thing, gather it up like so. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut this one because it's beautiful and I don't want to sacrifice it. But what you want to do is cut, the, gather up the whole plant, and cut it back at least in half. You can go even a little further than half if you want to. And what that's gonna do, that's gonna do two things. The most important thing, it's gonna promote fresh new growth which is gonna remain compact and tidy for the rest of the summer. It's also gonna produce more flowers. Um, they're never gonna rebloom the way they did the first time. That is an annual show. You're not gonna coax another one out of that, but they're gonna be lower and more compact and tidy for the rest of the summer, which is a, is a, is a much better look than a big floppy mess. And the other thing you really wanna do when you do cut them back is, and you can find, you can actually see the, the soil around your plants again, is um, grab some plant tone and give each plant a couple handfuls of plant tone. When you cut a plant back drastically like that and then want it to regrow all over again, that takes a lot of energy. And if you give your plants a little boost with some plant tone after you cut them back, that's gonna make that a lot easier for them to do. And also, you know, I'm, you know, I'm demonstrating cutting them back with this guy over here, which is kind of easy when it's just an individual plant like this, like we talked about. If you have established beds of nepeta, you may have to grab sections of a plant at a time and cut it back with your pruners, you know, kind of gather it up and go in. Just um, be careful to, of your fingers while you're doing it, because that hurts. Ask me how I know. Um, be very careful with that. So guys, if you already have nepetas, get those pruners sharpened and get ready to cut them back because it's almost time. And if you don't have nepetas already, consider giving them a chance because there's one that will work somewhere in any sunny landscape. Guys, as always, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.